everyone. I'm Sister Vasa, and live from Vienna, Austria, it's Saturday morning. I have a very exciting show for you today, my friends. Our guest today is the Reverend Professor Khaled Anatolius. Father Anatolius is the John A. O'Brien Chair of Theology at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, and he is also the Senior Ecumenical Fellow at the Tantur Ecumenical Institute of Notre Dame in Jerusalem. Father Anatolios was born of Egyptian parents in India. He returned to Egypt when he was three years old. Reminds me of another family that had to go to Egypt with a little boy. He returned to Egypt when he was three years old and spent the rest of his childhood and young adulthood in Egypt and Canada. He did his undergraduate studies in English literature and philosophy in Canada, and then completed his master's and doctoral studies in systematic and historical theology. He was ordained a priest of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church in 2015. He is married to Presbytera Meredith and is the father of four children. Among Father Anatolius's important publications, are Athanasius, The Coherence of His Thought, the Athanasius volume of the Rutledge Early Church Fathers series. By the way, as it happens, the word Khaled in Arabic means Athanasius or immortal. His other uh, very important publication is this book that I had the pleasure of reading just recently, Retrieving Nicaea. This important work uh, explains to us how relevant dogmatic theology is, specifically Trinitarian theology, to our everyday lives as Christians. But as you may have noticed, dogmatic theology seems to be, well, somehow not very much in fashion, or I think a lot of us have sort of lost the sense of what it has to do with our practical cross-carrying journeys. And the other important book, and the one that I will be uh, talking about with Father Khaled uh, today, is this book, Deification Through the Cross. This is a book about Christology and about the question that might be a question for many of you out there, my beloved viewers. What does salvation mean? So we will be talking with Professor Khaled about this question and I want to just mention that when we get to the part in this interview where we talk about some of the, uh, well, theological implications of the issues surrounding the COVID pandemic with relation to the distribution of Holy Communion, this conversation is just a conversation, right? Uh, academic theology does reflect on theological issues, uh, but both Father Anatolios and I, it should go without saying, do realize, as do all of we, that our bishops have the difficult task of making the practical decisions, and we pray that God give them always uh, the wisdom to make those difficult decisions with regard to the practical um, issues and how Holy Communion is distributed. But our conversation is not meant either to endorse or criticize uh, that way in which Holy Communion is distributed in our various churches during this difficult time. And just one thing before we get to the interview with Father Khaled, I want to remind you uh, that we do have a weekday audio podcast called Morning Coffee. And if you want to be accompanied in this final stretch before the Feast of the Lord's Nativity and have a bit of reflection on the hymnography and also the scripture passages, also the saints of the day, both older calendar and new calendar, every day to start your morning, to be grounded, uh, then tune in here, patreon.com slash sistervasa. You can subscribe for as little as $1. Uh, most people subscribe for 5 or $10 like this. You might find this helpful for your daily journey. So check it out, my friends, and you could always unsubscribe if you don't like it. Now, without any further ado, let's meet the Reverend Professor Khaled Anatolios. Prof. 
Professor Khaled, welcome. Welcome Hello. to our show. Hello, Sister Vasa. Very nice to meet you virtually. Very nice to meet you. Oh, same here. It's a great honor. You're a long-awaited guest on this show. People have asked for you to be on the show, and I said, well, he is not such an easy man to book. <laughs> um, well, it's, I it's, an honor, it's an honor to spend some time talking with you, Sister Vasa, and uh, um, I congratulate you on your wonderful ministry on the internet. Thank you, Father. Now, we have gathered here today, my viewers at home, <laughs> uh, to discuss this very recently published book, Hot Off the Presses, long-awaited book, Deification Through the Cross, by our guest today. And I am happy to say that I was able to read the book <laughs> and also to order this book before that one, Retrieving Nicaea. Uh, and now we will talk with Professor Khaled about his insights on salvation. Even though it's a term we all hear very often, uh, perhaps many of us never really thought about it. Like, what does it mean? What is it that we're saved from? So I'm gonna get right to my first question, Father. In this recently published book, Deification Through the Cross, you address a certain modern day confusion or befuddlement with this Christian understanding of salvation. So please summarize to me and to our viewers at home why Christians today would be confused about what it means to be saved. Yeah, thank you for that, that question. Um, so it's true that in the book, I speak about a certain confusion and befuddlement among modern day Christians about salvation. And um, when I speak of befuddlement and confusion that has the connotation of a lack of intellectual clarity, that we don't understand what we mean by salvation and, and how it happens through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and that's a meaning I intend and the whole book is designed to address that lack of intellectual clarity. But I think I wanna emphasize at the outset that um, the fundamental issue is more than just a lack of intellectual clarity. That for me, really, the fundamental issue is a lack or maybe a certain diminishment of the joy of salvation. Now, that's more fundamental. So, in a sense, you know, I, I, be, I, I begin the book with, the, the, I think the very first words are from uh, Psalm 51. Uh, you know, Psalm 50 in, in the Septuagint, uh, the, the great psalm of contrition, um, which includes the, the verse, restore to me the joy of salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. So that's really been the, the guiding thread, if you like, if you like, you know, you know that, you know, my prayer throughout this, this book, restore to me the joy of your, of your salvation. Now, for us Christians, that prayer has been answered. Through Christ. He has brought us salvation. He has brought us the joy of salvation. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of, of some of the, uh, some lines from uh, a great essay from one of my favorite theologians, Father Alexander Schmema. And you must have noticed that he's a big influence on, on this book. Um, so I remember Father Schmema you know, has an essay on the Eucharist, and he says that from the beginning, Christianity has been the proclamation of joy. And uh, I'm paraphrasing here, when, when Christianity ceases to be a proclamation of joy, it becomes incomprehensible. And that's certainly true with regard to the doctrine of salvation. Um, there, there's no proclamation of salvation, there's no experience of salvation without joy. You know, the joy of salvation is intrinsic to the contents of salvation. So, so the issue for me fundamentally is the restoring the joy of salvation. I mean, now you ask, you know, what went wrong? Why is it the case, if indeed it is the case, that we've somewhat lost the, at least the fullness of this joy? Now, in retrospect, I didn't put it this way in, in the book, you know, but in retrospect, I wonder if we can summarize it by saying that that the issue is, is certain dysfunctions in our experience of liturgy, scripture, and tradition. 
And maybe that's always at stake whenever there's befuddlement and whenever there's confusion and loss of joy, you know, in, in the Christian proclamation. Um, it's because we're not genuinely encountering scripture, uh, liturgy, scripture, and tradition. So, so, so how does that, how is that the case with regard to salvation? Well, I think with liturgy, maybe we've lost the sense that, that in liturgy, we experience salvation. That salvation happens in the liturgy. That, that it's not the case that we go to the liturgy because that's an obligation and, and as a reward, we get salvation after we die. <laughs> and that salvation happens to us, you know, after we die. Salvation happens right there at the liturgy. And the joy of salvation happens at the liturgy. Um, and uh, to know what it's to get a sense of what is salvation and and what is the joy of salvation we just have to be fully engaged with the liturgy understood as an experience of salvation that is given to us um, now as far as scripture <clears throat> I think the issue with scripture in in modern times is we read scripture we find numerous statements that indicate that we are saved to the suffering and death of Christ um, and that generates a lot of modern discomfort. People are uneasy about this language. You know, why should the death of an innocent man who is the incarnate son of God, no less, you know, why is that necessary for our salvation? You know, is that because there's a wrathful God that needs to be appeased, you know, and we don't want to go there. You know, that's primitive. That's something we have to get beyond. Um, and in the East, I think we're actually at a, at a special disadvantage because um, we've been told by Western theologians and sometimes by Eastern theologians too, that as Eastern Christians, we're not really into the cross and the, you know, the suffering of Christ, that we're saved through the suffering of Christ. You know, we're into more cheerful things like deification and incarnation and resurrection. We don't focus on that morbid stuff, you know about the, how we're saved through the suffering of Christ. Of course, that's completely bogus. That's not the Eastern tradition. And more fundamentally, um, that's not scripture, which tells us everywhere that we're, just, that we're uh, justified by his law, by his blood, that we've been reconciled to, to God through the death of his son and so on. So that's not a Western morbid notion. That's a scriptural notion. And it's completely Eastern. You, know, you just have to go to the liturgy. Um, and, and, and to the Eastern tradition. So, but, but if we're unable to read scripture with integrity because there are all these things we have to blot out and redact because we're ashamed of them and they don't make sense to us, then we have a problem and we can't experience salvation if we can't read scripture properly. Because again, it's, it's intrinsic to the content of sal salvation happens to the reading of scripture, just as it happens through the liturgy. And then thirdly, I think we have a problem with how we uh, appropriate uh, the teaching of tradition and the, 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 the experience of tradition about salvation. And here the problem, um, again, is it's, it's, it's a modern dogma among many theologians that the church has, has not, it doesn't say anything normative about salvation. That in the tradition just gives us a bunch of models, you know, or metaphorical constructs, such as Christus Victor, you know, Christ conquers the demons, and so we have salvation, or the Western model of satisfaction, you know, Christ overpays the death of sin, and, the, and so we have salvation. Um, and it's true we have these models, uh, but I want to say that if we look at the ecumenical councils, and the Trinitarian and Christological dogmas that we have that are the cornerstone of our faith, uh, embedded in these Trinitarian and Christological doctrines um, is a clear description and definition of salvation. And there what we find is that salvation is Trinitarian deification. Salvation is inclusion into the Trinitarian life from the position of the Son. You know, we become adopted. We enter into the Sonship of the Son. We relate to the Father and the Spirit from the position of the Son. We become fully enfolded 
in Trinitarian life. And that happens to us because the eternal word, the logos, the eternal son of the father has appropriated and transformed our human nature through its union with the divine nature. And that's the, the Christological foundation. So whatever we say about Christian salvation, we can have metaphors, we can have songs, we can dance, we can do whatever we want, but whatever we do, whatever we say, we always have to say it in terms of these Trinitarian and Christological parameters. So I think, you know, the befuddlement, you know, the, the diminishment of the joy of salvation has to do with these dysfunctions, you know, in our relation to liturgy, scripture, and tradition. I think to restore the joy of salvation, we have to reorient ourselves to the experience of liturgy as salvation, to a full and integral reading of all of scripture, and to um, an attentiveness to the tr Trinitarian and Christological uh, content of salvation as, as ultimately Trinitarian deification. Right, thank you uh, for your response, um, Father Anatolios. So let me get to my second question and to a, a term that's central to your uh, new book, uh, this term, doxological, contrition. Uh, please share with us uh, what you mean by salvation, uh, our salvation being affected by doxological, the doxological contrition of Christ. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so maybe the best way to answer that um, is, is again to go back to this framework of liturgy, scripture, and tradition. So the whole notion of doxological contrition, you know, that, that arises for me out of the liturgy, out of my experience of Byzantine liturgy. And, and it seems to me, so I, again, you know, assuming that, liturgy, that, that salvation happens at the liturgy, then we ask, well, what happens at the liturgy? And it seems to me what happens in the, in the liturgy is, is twofold. So we can talk about dialectic to use a fancy word, you know, two dimensions in relation to one another. So on the one hand, what happens in the liturgy is, is, is that's the primary thing that happens is doxology. Could you explain to us what doxology means? Yeah, exactly. So doxology means that in the liturgy, we have a manifestation of the glory of God. We have a manifestation of Trinitarian glory. Glory, my friends at home, as you probably know, excuse me if I'm insulting anybody's intelligence, but voxa means glory, right? It can also mean opinion as an ortho vox from voxa. Um, and so please continue, Father. Exactly. So it's the first meaning that I have, that I that I have in mind here. That that in the liturgy we have a manifestation of the divine presence, the power of that presence, the transformative power of that presence, the saving power of that presence, the beauty of that presence. Um, and and in the liturgy, and when we respond to this manifestation of the glory of God by glorifying God, by saying again and again, glory uh, to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we begin the liturgy with the great doxology, glory you to you. We don't spend liturgy complaining about all that is wrong with the world? Uh, we begin, <laughs> we begin with that a lot of come later. <laughs> but we begin with the glory of God. There is a lot of that's wrong with the, with, with the world, and we don't have amnesia about everything wrong with the world as soon as we enter church. However, as soon as we enter the liturgy, then all of that is relativized by the manifestation of the glory of God. You know, so as St. Paul says, you know, about, about the, when we finally see God to, to face to face that, you know, our, our sufferings are as nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. But that glory is already, you know, partially revealed to us in the liturgy and already in that glory, everything else fades in relation to that. You know, the glory becomes the, the paramount thing, the most urgent thing, the most resounding thing, the most overwhelming thing. 
we're taken up into that glory. Um, but then, as somewhat relating to, to what you said, um, in that experience of being enfolded and taken up into Trinitarian glory and glorifying God, we also experience our distance from divine glory. Um, we, we become cognizant, uh, we become aware of our desecration of the divine glory. Um, and we become aware, as you said, of all the problems of the world as manifestations of the whole world's distance from divine glory. And when we become aware of that, then our glorification flows into contrition, flows into repentance, um, flows into a desire to return. So that, you know, the, 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 the Old Testament word for repentance literally means in Hebrew, return. And that's that's oh. an excellent. Exactly. So that, that's exactly how we should think about repentance. It's a return to Trinitarian glory. So, so in the liturgy, we say, you know, here's the glory of God, but oh, I, and yet, paradoxically, I can see it, and God is gracious enough to reveal it to me, but I'm so distant from it, and I need to return. I need to make my, make my way back to that glory. So in a sense, you know, in liturgy, we have that experience that Isaiah has. Um, when he says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I belong to a people of unclean lips, but I have seen the Lord of hosts. And that's the experience, I think, of everybody genuinely engaged in liturgy. You know, I've seen the Lord of hosts. I've seen the, the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and yet, woe is me, uh, for I am a sinner, and I belong to... Uh, a people, the whole human race, a people of sinners. So if you like, to that dialectic, you know, it, it, in a way, it's, it's sort of my own, uh, in, light of, in light of the questions that I'm, uh, that I'm dealing with this in this book, sort of my own interpretation of, of something that has already been said, which is the phrase that, that's been used, bright sadness, you know, to speak of Byzantine liturgy, Byzantine spirituality. And I'm saying, this bright sadness we can talk about as doxological contrition. We can further specify that, that the brightness is the brightness of the glory of God. What else brightness can there be? And the sadness has to do, is evoked by our sense of how we fall short of that glory. As St. Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when we witness the glory of God, we witness how much we fall short of it. And then we have that sadness. You know how far I and this whole world is estranged from that glory, um, and that and that's the, that dialectic. You know, so that's really where I get the whole construct of doxological contrition of the experience of salvation as an experience of this bright sadness, um, uh, of, of glory and contrition. But I think also liturgy raises the question, which is. If the experience of salvation can be described as doxological contrition, then should we not say that Christ grants us this salvation through his own doxological contrition on our behalf? Now, why would we say that? I think we say that because there's, there's a fundamental principle in our faith um, that the effect of Christ's work of salvation was realized, first of all, in his own humanity. That whatever Christ gives to us, he performs first in his own humanity. That's why he became incarnate. Otherwise, he'd just sort of do it from heaven without incarnation. But, but the whole principle of the incarnation means that whatever, you know, whatever are the effects of Christ's work, they were effected in himself and his humanity first. We received deification because his humanity was deified. Um, so that, so then, so then, when we go to scripture, then we 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 can guided by the Byzantine liturgy's interpretation of scripture, as I take it, we can ask, you know, is it true that the scriptures that we can read the scriptures in this light, you know, uh, of understanding salvation as doxological contrition, um, of understanding Jesus' salvific work as doxological contrition, and so. And I think, yes, I think that throughout the Old and New Testaments, 
salvation is always correlated with the manifestation of divine glory. You know, whether in the in the Exodus, you know, the paradigmatic event of salvation in the Old Testament, where you know the where, where the glory of God is not just at the end of the road, the glory of God accompanies the Israelites in, in the Exodus, you know, in their flight from Egypt to the promised land. They're accompanied by the presence of the Lord in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And at the same time, um, salvation is always correlated with repentance. So Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is salvation, but we have to receive it in the mode of repentance. Now, I'll give you just one example and a very important one of how scripture gives us um, an insight into what I call the inner form of Jesus' salvific work as doxological contrition, and that is the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. So John the Baptist before Jesus begins his public ministry, invites people to a baptism of repentance. And Jesus comes to receive this baptism, um, which initially shocks the Baptist. Now, why would Jesus come to receive a baptism of repentance? I think there, there are only two options. Either, as some modern theologians have suggested, Jesus was himself conscious that he's a sinner and needs repentance which would be completely out of line with the rest of the New Testament, where we know that Jesus was like us in all things except sin. So you have to rule out that option. Jesus didn't come forward as somebody who was a repentant sinner. So the other option is that Jesus comes forward uh, in solidarity with sinners um, as a kind of vicarious repentance on contrition on behalf of sinners, you know, to intercede on their behalf. So Jesus doesn't stand apart from sinners and say, okay, all you sinners, you go and receive this baptism of repentance, but I'm the sinless one. You come to me when you've repented and I'll save you. You know, he goes there and stands uh, among sinners and accepts this, this baptism of repentance, you know. Um, but then what happens after that? A manifestation of Trinitarian glory, right? So as we sing in the Troparium, at your baptism in the Jordan, O Lord, the worship of the Trinity was revealed. Whenever there's worship, there's glory. And so the glory of God was manifest, the Father's voice saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, the Spirit in the form of a dove. And so out of Jesus, um, vicarious contrition or representative contrition or contrition on our behalf or solidarity with us as sinners, there arises this doxology, this manifestation of Trinitarian glory. Um, so I think we can read, so the, the effort in this book is to read scripture under the guidance of this Byzantine experience, liturgical experience of doxological contrition, try to understand salvation that way. And then finally, tradition, in terms of tradition, um, as I said, every uh, there are many ways to talk about salvation, and they're, they're infinite, and we'll keep singing that song for eternity and finding new ways to sing the song of salvation and to describe the glory of God's salvific work in you know, infinitely um, diverse ways. But ultimately, we have to take it back to Trinitarian Christological doctrine. And so... In terms of Trinitarian doctrine, I want to go back to um, the description that we have from uh, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, for one, who speaks about the, the, the Trinity as a circle of glory. And each, each person glorifies the other. And, and he and, and St. Basil also Gregory, as you know, often takes up themes from his brother, St. Basil. Um, they're speaking in the context of worship, and they're saying our glorifying of God in worship is a participation in the inner glorification among the persons of the Trinity. Okay, So we have this foundation, Trinitarian doctrine. The Trinitarian life is a life of mutual glorification of the persons. Each glorifies the other. 
there's plenty of indications that in the Gospel of John, for example. Okay, so now um, in terms of Christological doctrine, what we can say is by is that by taking on our humanity, Jesus translates his divine glorification of the Father in the Spirit in human terms. And, and he continues that glorification in his humanity. But in light of our sin, that glorification also has to take on the mode of contrition. You know, of, um, of Christ's sorrow over our sins and his intercession for the, for the Father's forgiveness, you know, uh, on our behalf. And so that's how... Um, that's that, that's 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 a way I think of conceiving sort of what I call the inner form of Christ's salvific work. That what you know everything Christ does, and everything Christ does is salvific. Everything Christ does, he he saves us by returning us to this perfect glorification of the Father and the Spirit, um, which also takes account of our sins by um, communicating that to us. The, the contrition that we should have for our sins in light of God's glory. Right. Thank you for that, Father Anatolios. I'm also thinking you're making, uh, you know, me think about being crucified amongst thieves, uh, mm. just right smack in the middle of the worst of the criminals, and then uh, indeed being accepting our sins as his own, right? Uh, exactly exactly so so christ puts no distance between himself and sinners and that that he did that throughout his life by you know eating with sinners joining with them in table fellowship and he did that in his death as you as you eloquently just described um and, and to the point where saint paul that can, can say that christ became sin for us right well, that's it well how did he become sin well he certainly didn't become sin by becoming sinful, but he became sin by, by transforming our sinfulness into contrition. And that way you can say, to use another Pauline phrase, he condemned our sin in his flesh. And to condemn sin in the flesh is, is another way to talk about contrition. When we- Nailed when we, it to the cross. Exactly. You know, you're also making me think about these processions that happen in Byzantine liturgy that have often by Byzantine liturgical commentators been seen as this path of Christ's life. But, you know, even say the small entrance that has a complicated history that uh, most people don't know the purpose of, but, uh, you know, beginning in one place and ending up in that same place as it appears. Uh, and also, you know, the ascension being a return, one could say, from whence he came. Um, our humanity making that return, or his passage, the Pascha, right? The transitus uh, into our darkness, even unto hell, and then emerging from there. Like, we couldn't return out of there. There was no return. We were, it was like quicksand, right? For as far as our... Uh, situation went. But I want to get to a next question, Father. Can I stop you, Father, Sister Vasa, because I just want to comment a little bit about the, this wonderful reflections that you have. That, that's, that's beautiful what you just said. So, so first of all, in, 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 you know, when you're talking about processions, and, um, and, 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 and as you know, I mean, you know, part of the background of processions is not just a procession within the church, but, but the historical background to that are the certain processions that, that, that happened from church to church and that went through the streets. So you can see that that's sort of a, sort of the glory of God traveling through, through the world, right? Um, through the city. And in that sense, you know, th there's a solidarity there with the glory of God, between the glory of God and, and the world and whatever is wrong with the world, you know? Um, so there's that solidarity performed, you know, which we still do, right? When we, when we have, at least in, in the, the Melchi church, we have, we go, you know, we do processions, festive processions outside the church, you know? 
on great feasts like pa um, mm -hmm. uh, Palm Sunday, for example, we go outside, right? So we prove you know, so the God's glory processes through the world and through the, the the darkness of the world and thereby invites doxological contrition. Right. You know? We also uh, make a return. You know, we have a sense when we have the litia at the towards the end of Vespers, Byzantine Vespers, right. uh, that's also often omitted in certain in many parishes, but there's a sense of voluntary exile of leaving and then having these multiple Kyrie eleisons of, uh, you know, Lord have mercies and taking on like an entire fasting period, say in Lent, there's a sense of exile of, you know, returning into a reality of the Old Testament and retrieving the yearning the desire of the nations. You know, right now, a lot of the minor prophets are celebrated and uh, well, the prophet Daniel, um, just recently on the new calendar and so forth, we're also experiencing some of this exile and then returning, like the entrance after having that litany outside, it's supposed to be done in the narthex and then come back in, but also a procession out of church and then returning back into it is one of these reminders, you know, because when we do, it's like learning by doing these when somebody says many happy returns, I like to think of it as, as if they're saying that. Uh, but you're making me think about these things. Thank you so much, Father Anatolius. You know what I want to uh, really ask you importantly, because it's Christmas season now. And uh, I think many of us uh, uh, belonging to the Byzantine rite, whether in the various Orthodox churches or Greek Catholic ones, uh, might notice that the Byzantine rite doesn't make as much of a big deal out of this feast of Christmas or the nativity of our Lord as does Latin Christianity or Western Christianity, but it rubs off on us as well. You can't see my Christmas tree up, but you can see some of my tacky Christmas decorations uh, right behind me. It rubs off on us to have more uh, attention paid to the feast of the first epiphany or in the flesh it is the first time we see i mean he doesn't become incarnate in bethlehem that happens at the annunciation but he appears amongst us and somehow we'll notice uh if we pay attention that uh, say if you compare the nativity fast to the structure of lent nativity fast doesn't have special except for yes it has two preceding sundays before Christmas, you know, of the forefathers and of the fathers, which are basically the same thing if you pay attention to the hymnography. Um, but it's not this, we're not accompanied by special hymnography throughout the 40 days of Nativity Fest. So one can notice that somehow, uh, you know, the bigger deal and what we call the Feast of Feasts is Pascha or Easter. That is completely, you know, accompanied and accommodated uh, with the wealth, uh, you know, all of the Byzantine talent throughout history, uh, hymnographic talent, and uh, we are accompanied. So my question connected to this uh, is um, a theological one. Is the disparity between the attention paid to what happens to all of us in Christ on Pascha, when he resurrects, is, and then the perception of what actually happens when the mother of God, the most blessed virgin, gives birth in Bethlehem, which one could argue is the vocation of the church, and the most blessed virgin is always an image of the church, not because she's a mythological figure, God forbid I say that, she is a real human, you know, as my mentor, Father Taft would say, a poor Jewish girl with no washing machine that had to give birth to the Son of God. <laughs> um, but already, isn't already everything there? Isn't the celebration in Western Christianity of, you know, that one of us, a mere human young woman, gives birth to God in the flesh? Um, isn't all of salvation already there? Because isn't his humanity before the resurrection, as he also you know, reveals on the mountain of the transfiguration all the time. He's just not showing us his whole, you know, it's like he's always Clark Kent, but sorry, that's irreverent, but he's not, 
you know, being Superman all the time. Um, but my question is, is there a difference in uh, understanding the salvificalness, <laughs> probably not a word, of his humanity, even before he is glorified through the cross and resurrection? Are we, I, you know, God forbid, could we misunderstand that he becomes more divinized? Like in a, isn't that a monop either a monophysite or a Nestorian idea to think that Christ becomes more divinized after the resurrection? And this is connected with certain issues in our time uh, about, you know, when we are sacramentally partaking of his body and blood mm -hmm. and we discuss it to what extent if at all are the holy gifts because that's the body and blood of christ within this world mm -hmm. um people say in byzantine theology and uh, well it, throughout its development anyway that we partake of the resurrected body of christ in the eucharist and hence now in say something like a COVID-19 uh, or novel coronavirus pandemic, um, the holy gifts are not vulnerable to any of these realities of, well, that basically to corruption. So, and this, despite the fact that one can observe the already sanctified lamb, if it's not preserved correctly, being covered with uh, mold and, and things like this. So, my question being, um, can we, first of all, is there a difference between the salvificalness of post-resurrected Christ and his pre-resurrectional deified humanity? Because as you have mentioned, Father, uh, indeed, he, he has a deified humanity from the outset, right? He doesn't increasingly become deified, as the Nestorian said, well, in the, you know, simplified version. Um, so that's my question. I'm, I'm just going to... Uh, you know, sum it up. Is there a difference in understanding salvation as far as incarnation goes? Because the fathers did have a discussion about this when Cyril of Alexandria, for example, polemicizing with Nestorius, also talks about, you know, the Eucharist uh, being already made possible by the incarnation. And, and it is at the mystical supper when Christ institutes something like even though in John 6, he's already talking about eat my flesh and nobody knows what he's talking about. It's just gross to the Jews that are listening to him. Uh, but it's way before, it's even before that Passover when he has the mystical supper with his disciples. But here he's already saying, take and eat. So that's my question. Is there a difference in perceiving salvation as being sort of more complete or, you know, ready for us after resurrection? Or is it completely there? let's say, at Christmas in Bethlehem. It's just that he still has, of course, work to do, but he, he, we can salvifically partake of him already. Wow. <laughs> so that's a, that's a wonderfully complex question, Sister Vasa. So it, it seems to me there, there are three dimensions to your question. Okay, there's the, the liturgical dimension. How do we understand the Feast of Christmas in relation to the Feast of um of easter and related to that is how we understand the the the, the status of the eucharistic gifts you know the eucharistic presence of the lord so these, these are liturgical question then there's the christological question how do we understand the incarnation in relation to the resurrection uh, and also the ecumenical question, you know, how do East and West understand this differently? Now, I think that, I think as, as you yourself indicated among your, your remarks, that everything is settled really by the Christological question, by the relationship between uh, the incarnation and the death and, and resurrection. Now, let's begin with the essential principle, patristic principle, right? That, God the Word became human in order to make us divine. Okay, so there we have salvation, the content of salvation as the union, the transformative union of humanity and divinity in Christ. Okay, I think 
what we have to say is that there are two, again, there, there's a dialectic, or there, there are two, um, two uh, at least two dimensions to this, to the, to the way, to the, how we can conceive of this union, you know. So on the one hand, the union of Christ, divinity, and humanity is complete from the moment of conception. And so the basis of our deification is fully established from that moment. Humanity and divinity in Christ are fully united. They don't get more united day by day. They're fully united. There's a fullness of hypostatic union. The human nature is fully appropriated by the person or hypostasis of the divine word from the moment of conception. That's all in place. At the same time, the manifestation of that union in the humanity of our Lord takes the normal course of human life, which is a course of growth and development. Christ, the, the word would not become human if he did not take up the sequence of human life. Because if he didn't take up the temporal, the temporality of human life, right. because oh. a human being is not some static substance right a human being is a temporal human is a temporal being a human being is a sequence and so uh, is a temporal sequence and so if christ becomes human he has to manifest uh, his divinity and he has to manifest the union between his divinity and humanity within a sequence of of you know growth and development now so putting these two things together, I think what we have to say is that every moment of Jesus' human life, including his death and resurrection, every moment of Jesus' human life manifests the fullness of the union of his humanity and divinity in a particular way. So the whole reality is manifest at every point of the sequence without annulling the sequence. Now, to take that to liturgy, in the same way that Jesus' human life was sequential, it followed a sequence of growth and development, so also the liturgical year manifests a sequence. It manifests the fullness of Christ for us according to his growth and development. Otherwise, every Sunday there would be no feast. You know, every and, and and there'd be no, you know, there'd be no uh, cycle of readings in which every time, you know, we look at a different event in Jesus' life. Then, then every every time we celebrate the liturgy, we should just read the resurrection, because because Christ is 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 the resurrected Christ. Well, you know, he's the resurrected Christ, but the Christ that's resurrected is a fully human Christ who who brings his the whole sequence of his life into his death and resurrection. So, so then it's always the whole Christ that we celebrate and adore and have communion with in every liturgy and at every feast. But at different feasts, we celebrate the fullness of Christ by tending specifically to our particular manifestation of that fullness. Right. Um, and so both feasts refer to each other. And we always, you know, yes, it's always the, 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 the risen Christ. But the risen Christ doesn't, annul the crucified Christ and doesn't annul the, the child Christ and the baby Christ, all of that is included, you know. Um, so, so now I think when all is said and done, it makes sense that, that, that Easter is the Feast of Feasts because with Easter, the manifestation is complete. You know, especially if you, if you then, if you look at Easter and, and Ascension, and, and in the Byzantine liturgy, I even argue. I was, I was in the, I was saying, I'd say in the Byzantine liturgy, I'd, I'd even say a Pentecost, and and that and that and that in Pentecost, and I talk about this in the book. In Pentecost, the fullness of the manifestation of Trinitarian glory is um, it is made accessible to us. Um, now, in terms of you know communion, that's a very sensitive subject, and I you know. Um, I'm not aware that the, the, the church has dogmatically pronounced on it on this particular instance, but I, but I would want to say that I think 
you know, something that you said, I think is very wise, which is, you know, Jesus is the God man. He's not Superman, <laughs> you know? And so on the cross, I mean, you know, the crucified, the risen Christ is the crucified Christ. He, he did not, you know, crush his enemies. He allowed himself to be crucified by his enemies. And so, and so when we have communion with the Lord, we have communion with the vulnerability of the Lord. Um, and, and, and not simply with invulnerability, you know, from all temporal vicissitudes and all temporal afflictions. That seems to me to be, you know, you talk about Nestorian uh, um, monophysite. I would, I would, I would, I would, I wonder if there's a docetic tinge to that, you know, docetic, you know, this notion that, that, that Christ's humanity isn't, isn't real or it's not, there's no vulnerability there, you know. That, both that home docetism, or maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong, um, to, it comes from, you know, vocao to, to, or to seem exactly. that there were heretics uh, in ancient times that said, and it's a little bit reflected in the Quran, I think, that Christ only seemed to um, suffer, for example, on the cross, or he seemed to be in the form for them, yeah. our benefit, mm -hmm. but he yeah. really wasn't. So the uh, uh, professor Khaled is saying, is there a, a little bit of a tinge of saying the Eucharistic gifts only seem to be material? Uh, they are indeed, of course, the true body and blood of Christ, but Christ- I, I, I think, is, yeah, I think the issue well. there, you know, that, that, yeah, that, that, you know, we say in the liturgy that, that Jesus, you know, on the night he was um, betrayed or rather gave himself up or handed himself over, there is a real kenosis, a real emptying of, uh, you know, that Jesus um, performed throughout his, his life and continues to perform in the Eucharist, which is handing himself over, you know, and we can't deny the vulnerability of that, you know, um, and so, yeah, we have to take care of the Eucharistic gifts and not just say, you know, they're invulnerable, therefore we're not gonna take care of them and we're not gonna, you know, uh, no, we, we have to um, acknowledge and, 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 and protect the vulnerability of the Lord um, and by, um, not just by protecting, you know, the gifts and the materiality, but also by um, protecting them uh, by receiving them with uh, with with faith and patrician and uh, and glorifying the Lord and not um, you know haphazardly or um, you know without without seriousness and without attentiveness. So we have to acknowledge the the vulnerability of the Lord in His life, in His death, and and in the Eucharist. Uh, the, 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 it's... I think, you know, also of the vulnerability that he willed, according to his prayer to the Father in John 17, you know, I ask not that you take them out of this world, but sanctify them in your truth. So the church in this sacramental reality of the church that is dealing with intermediary or symbols, symbols not meaning that they're not real, but symbols yeah. as in, for the folks at home, simvalo, bringing together yeah. two realities, the visible and invisible, there's a vulnerability to that church, the church's being within time. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I can, I, I can see the, the, your, your point there. And then, you know, so, so another image that comes to mind, you know, that, that with some, you know, um, some, some ancient Gnostic lore, you know, there was this image of the, the real Christ, um, um, you know, departing from, the fleshly Jesus on the cross and laughing at the side of the cross. Right, right, so right. I don't think we want to so understand, you know, um, partaking of the risen crucified Christ in such a way as if that communion enables us to laugh at the affliction of the world. All oh, right. Instead of to be in solidarity with the affliction of the world, just as Jesus was. Right. Um, so, so certainly through the Eucharist or through Christian faith in general, we don't get a pass, you know, 
so that we're never afflicted by the afflictions of the world. Right. Um, no, no, we were given uh, the power to suffer these afflictions in solidarity with the world according to the design of God's providence to suffer these afflictions in such a way as to um, pass over with Christ from these afflictions to the fullness of Trinitarian glory. Right. You know, what else, Father? Thank you so much for those uh, insights. I sometimes think as well about the wounds of Christ after his resurrection. You know, he could have just somehow healed of the wounds, but Thomas can touch his wounds, even though our Lord is, you know, despite the closed doors entering, it's not like he couldn't have done a lot of that kind of thing before the resurrection if he wanted, but, you know, he didn't. He didn't throw himself off the building either when the devil told him that, you know, according to Psalm 90, uh, you know, the angels would, would uh, catch him. Um, so... It, I don't know if it makes a difference, you know, post-resurrection, pre-resurrection, as far as the sacramental reality of the church that he founds. It, it, to me, it seems like certainly our Lord never promised us invincibility, even though he did say, you know, you will, when he's parting from his disciples, you will drink poison and it won't harm you, right? You will take snakes and they won't harm you. But has the church ever said, please, everybody, drink poison if you're the real deal, you know, handle snakes, children, you know, do it because we want to see that you have real faith. You know, I don't, I've never heard in all of history, for example, that when the Lord said to his disciples, if you had faith, even as a mustard, mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move, and it would move, you know, into that uh, lake or, or sea. Have you ever heard of anybody moving a mountain? I think he's reminded us that maybe we never had faith even as a mustard seed, as far as God's perception of the kind of faith that he deserves. You know, have we ever been able to respond with that kind of faith? We're, we seem to be claiming it today uh, as far as the Eucharist goes. We're all worthy. You know, 1 Corinthians 11 about St. Paul, the whole conversation about Eucharist can harm you if you're not worthy. Uh, we seem to say it can't because we're all worthy. Uh, this has been on a lot of people's minds. You know, it's, it's, it's a concern. Thank you for letting me lead you down that rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, now for our last question. Uh, could you tell all of us and those watching from home, how can we, in the most practical terms, and at this time of the COVID pandemic, it's especially tough year, rediscover or get in touch with our own experience of being saved through this dialectic of doxology, that is praising God and contrition. Yes, thank you, Sister Voss. That's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, what I like about that question especially is that, is that the premise of the question is that salvation, the salvation that God offers us happens in the concrete. It's not something ethereal or abstract or something that happens after we die, but God works his salvation in the midst of the earth, as the psalmist says, you know. Um, so, so then we can ask, you know, how is God working his salvation in the midst of this devastated earth in this time of pandemic? And how can we partake of this salvation? Um, through this dialectic of doxology and, and contrition um, or repentance. Well, let's, let's begin with repentance. You know, so in the, in, in the scriptures and in much of Christian tradition until very lately, the experience of catastrophe um, consistently evokes a call for repentance. So the first thing that Christians do and, and the people of Israel, when they experience catastrophe, is they, um, they repent of their sins. They try to get returned to the Lord, you know. Um, now, here's some, something that I found very ironic um, lately, is that a lot of modern Christians find that kind of reaction to be inappropriate. 
So by and large, Christians have not been saying, um, have not been saying that that in reaction to this pandemic, we have to repent first and foremost. Um, and yet, if you look at the secular media, this is the intriguing thing. Um, you know, I've been uh, collecting, you know, examples of this. If you look at the the, the the secular media, we find that in fact they're using that same logic in a secularized way. So there are all kinds of, you know, essays and articles and in the press and so on saying, um, look, you know, this happened because we did a bunch of things wrong, you know, and they, they have their, everybody has their, um, you know, their, their, their ideas about that. It's because human beings have been encroached too much on the natural habitat of non-human species and so on, or in America, because we have a, a devastated, unworkable medical system that can't handle this and so on. Um, so, so, so people talk about what we did wrong, and then, and then they suggest uh, ways of repentance. So they don't call it repentance, you know. But uh, I, there's an article I cite in the preface of the book. You know, somebody says we must do things differently at the other end, you know. And I've seen this refrain again and again. We we can't go back to where we we were before, you know. So that that's re that's repentance. That's a sort of a secularized pattern of, of, of repentance. Um, now. From a Christian point of view, you don't have to say that the coronavirus was caused by this or that particular sin. And so we have to cut out that sin and then the pandemic will go away. The, the, the logic of repentance goes deeper than that. And, and the way I've expressed it in the book is by saying uh, that every manifestation of the brokenness of the world exposes our complicity in this brokenness. Um, and so when we see this brokenness, you know, in our, I think that, you know, the, 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 the pandemic exposes all kinds of bro uh, brokenness, the, the brokenness of our being estranged from God. We're not in paradise. We're not in Eden. We're, we're in exile, you know, um, uh, the brokenness in our social structures, uh, in our economic structures and so on. Um, but then we have to ask ourselves, you know, how am, each one of us, how am I complicit in this brokenness as an individual, as, you know, in, in the church? You know, how is the church complicit in the brokenness of the world? Um, and, and, uh, and then by recognizing that we have the opportunity to heal that brokenness, you know, to, to repair that brokenness um, as much as it's given to us through the power of Christ, who is all powerful. At the same time, so that's the repentance aspect. At the same time, you don't have to wait until the world is completely healed before we're in possession of the joy of salvation. Because that joy is already present, is already given us whenever we recognize and contemplate the glory of God shining in the face of Christ. So just as the Israelites, you know, as I said, the glory of God wasn't waiting for them at the other end you know, but accompanied them throughout. And God's glory full is, is, is accompanies us, is accompanying us um, through this terrible time. It's, it's a terrible time, but it's a time also of the manifestation of God's glory because that's the content of all time. The, 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 the deep content of all time is the manifestation of divine glory. Um, and especially and manifestly so, since the incarnation of our Lord, in which we look at that glory with unveiled faces now, in a way that wasn't available before the incarnation. So we have to repent, and we have to make this uh, pandemic an occasion to return to the fullness of divine glory. We have to take refuge in our immersion in that glory. That's our antidote to despair. Um, we, we have to be immersed in that glory through prayer, through liturgical, sacramental prayer, whenever that's available to us. Um, but even when it's not available, we have to have confidence that the glory of God shining in the face of Christ travels with us through our circumstances, however terrible uh, they, they are, just like that pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And that pillar is Jesus Christ, whose glory is with us by day and by night. And he's finally the joy of our salvation, who, which is always available to us 
no matter how dire or deadly the circumstances seem to be. Thank you so much, um, Professor Khaled. That was so beautiful. Everybody, uh, Professor Khaled is going to say goodbye to you now. Will you offer us a blessing, Father? Uh, thank you, Sister Vasa. It's been a blessing to, um, to speak with you. And it's been a blessing to um, see how you try to manifest God's glory to the world uh, through the internet, which is a place that's not completely full of glory, <laughs> which uh, lacks a lot of glory. Um, so, uh, so thank you for the blessing of spending this time with you and for partaking of your wonderful ministry. And, um, and may God bless, bless you and, and bless all of us uh, with the manifestation of his glory and with the power to lead us into genuine repentance in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. So, Father, if you bless all of us uh, in this pre-Christmas time, uh, everybody at home, uh, chin up, everybody, and let's not neglect the presence of God in our midst, even during our exile, our wanderings, right, in the wilderness of this year. Don't forget to get Father Khaled Anatolius's book, Deification Through the Cross. You can find it on Amazon, my friends. And join us on our weekday podcast. We are in the final stretch. New calendar folks sooner than us older calendar folks. But every weekday, we are having our audio podcast known as Morning Coffee. I'll put the link up here. My friends, do join us. Join our zillions of subscribers. We're very engaged. We share uh, our ups and downs on patreon.com slash sister vasa so join us and the wise men as we follow the star my friends father khaled a big round of applause everybody from your homes all around the world for our distinguished and pastorally helpful guest bye everybody bye thank you sister vasa